I, um, if anyone's against it, just let me know in the chat that you don't want to be recorded. Um, but I just really like, I really like hearing this feedback and these ideas. They're profound. Oh, I think Nathaniel wants to say oh. something. Go for it. Oh, yeah. And just going off of, of a lot of what Rachel is saying, I think um, a lot of that idea in Homo sapiens being applied to our society is just in the ubiquity of advertising. Um, and I think one of the ways this has become really interesting today is how social media has become a vector for advertising. Like it's not just ads in social media apps. It's you know, sponsored social media people um, turning their posts into specifically targeted ads. Um, and it's become so much more high tech with, you know, tracking ads and cookies. Yeah, it's like, it's um, like we're being followed by advertisements. Like instead it, yeah. of the Nos, where back in Soviet times, your neighbors are reporting you on you or the Komsomol is reporting on you and there's always someone following everything. It's now like instead of political authorities following us, it's advertisements that are following us. Right. And this is exactly what Pelevin mm -hmm. is saying. He's replacing... And what he's doing with this book is he's replacing the political totalitarian structure of communism and saying, no, communist totalitarianism of the Soviet Union is no longer anymore. But you know what has happened since we've gone to a capitalist society that very much resembles America's is we have a new totalitarian structure. It's just that it's capitalism. It's a capitalist totalitarian structure. Mm -hmm. and, and because that... Because technology has become so ubiquitous and so relied upon, you can't escape the ads coming through your technology. You just can't. It's like they're everywhere. You can't escape it. Just like Komsomol. Just like people giving us, you know, the Dunos, done a seat to report on. You never know where they are. You never know when your neighbor is going to rat on you. It's everywhere all at once. Exactly. Good point. Um, any more comments on this? Alex, did you want to say something? You were kind of, your image sort of came through the ether. Oh, um, I wasn't going to say anything, but I kind of, uh, maybe Rachel, if I could get some clarification on your point, were you saying, okay, that American society, like we have aspects that are separate from the capitalist structure? So I guess what I meant is, it was more direct, I should rephrase this. Uh, so I think that we have our norms, but I think that it's pretty, it's pretty common in the U.S. to view capitalism as an ideology, but not as a religion to, to worship. Um, and not necessarily, I think that it's not necessarily core to our identity to be capitalist I, i'm trying to think how to put this i think that in the soviet union your identity as a worker and your identity as a human being got conflated and that that to a large degree continued afterwards um in post-soviet union mm -hmm. i think in the u.s it's not that we don't have a component of our identity that is capitalist because i think that that's very closely tied to being American, but I think that we have two separate worlds where one is involved in our identity as workers and capitalists when we go to work or we go to school, and one that changes when we get home and we engage in our hobbies. And I think that you're right, that as technology has advanced, those two have become more and more intertwined. Um, our hobbies become more and more about capitalism and are used for capitalism. But at the end of the day, I think that we're able to separate that. And I'm not sure that that's as much the case in a post-Soviet Union Russia. Hmm. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to think of areas that aren't permeated by capitalism. Because I, rem I remember you mentioned, like, religion. And I'm just thinking how, like, oh, like, I don't think in terms of, like you know, right now. Capitalism, but they aren't core to our identity every moment of our lives. So, like, even if, let's say, two churches might engage in capitalism in some way, 
your identity as a church member isn't necessarily tied to your job or isn't necessarily tied to who you are as a consumer and producer. Or maybe your hobbies aren't closely tied to it or philosophy for you isn't always closely tied to it. I think in this in the world of the Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union, you see that almost all literature, art, almost everything is created from the base of promoting communism or afterwards dealing with a change to capitalism. Um, again, like if you go into an art museum in Russia, very rarely do you see a piece of work that social commentary that doesn't have to do with either communism or a transition afterwards. I, I really, I really think I, I'm picking up what, what you're saying, Rachel, because I think, I think in a lot of ways, American culture is very tied to economics, but in, in our capitalist system, but it's also sort of been that way for the entire history of the country. Yeah. Whereas in Russia, um, there was so much culture that was built around the the state, around the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the Soviet Union dissolves, there's this new culture that grows up around this new economic system um, and how much power money has. So I think that change and the swiftness and, and the dramatic level of that change um, it, it, asks, it puts it at a higher level than the way that we experience that in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. It's not that they're on opposite ends of the scale. I just think that as extreme as the U.S. can be towards capitalism from our own perspective since we live in it, it's very moderate when you compare it to the connections between Soviet Union and communism. And I think that that would carry over afterwards in the transition between those economic models. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to disagree with one of your points where you said that identity isn't as deeply tied. I think that's, mm -hmm. it's more so like, I mean, the existence of phrases like blue collar worker versus white collar worker signifies that, you know, identity is still very deeply tied to capitalism and our identities of where we are on like social status um but i think what happens is that we're just in later stage of capitalism so it becomes even less it becomes more difficult to sort of differentiate between ourselves and our like workers lives and um i don't know if it's making sense but it becomes way more different than the way that we see it in palaben's book because they are in an earlier stage of capitalism yeah, um, so that's I personally experienced that transition. It's less obvious to us that we're deeply entrenched within it. I totally get that. Again, I, I don't think that capitalism isn't a part of our identities. I think it is. I just, I guess I'm talking about like, to what degree? Like, can we separate our personal identities from capitalism at the end of the day? Or is there a complete inability to in any part of our lives? Wow, that's that's a great question. Can we now? And does does this book by Pelevin make us think? And I think it gives us pause to think: Can we separate our individual selves, ourselves, our everyday lives, our personalities, our beings, from capitalism at some point during the day? Is that actually possible for us? I don't think so. And I think like a big reason for that is like socioeconomic status is something that imprints on you when you're born. Like, you know, whether you were born into a rich home, a poor home, a middle class home, and that informs so much of your experience. Like mm -hmm. someone who grew up in a lower middle class family is going to have a completely different set of references and knowledge um, than someone who grew up in a rich family and i also think like that's why this idea of the american dream like is so is so toxic especially in late stage capitalism where it's becoming more and more unattainable so like no i don't think like in a certain way i don't think there is a way to separate our identities from capitalism because capitalism shapes almost all of our experiences from the moment we're born oh that's just beautiful jonathan and um I mean, you know, the ideas are not very positive, they're, they're grim, but it, you just, you put it and you articulated it so well. And I really also appreciate how, you know, you 
brought up the topic of American dream, which certainly permeates the book by Pelevin. I mean, where is he, where is this impulse to draw from Sprite and Coke and make a lot of money from it come from? And, you know, Jonathan referred to the American dream as toxic. Yeah. Um, can I build off of that really quick? Yeah. Sorry, I know I've been talking a lot, but um, so I agree with you to a certain degree. I think that there's a lot of ideas that inform who we are, which I know everybody knows that, but like, I think that capitalism and your socioeconomic status, uh, what, what, how you're taught to understand the world economically plays a huge part in who you are from that moment on. But so does things like, um, gender, family, um, where you're raised politics. And I think that we live in a country where even though, even though capitalism plays a huge part, each of those individually play an almost equally large part. I think what's almost unique about the Soviet Union is the disproportionate role that economics and politics plays in personal identity. So again, it's not that it doesn't play a huge role. I just think that it's balanced out with a lot of other factors when you're living in the U.S. because we have really, really diverse social discourse and we have so many topics that are entrenched into our society. And I think that during the Soviet Union and during the transition afterwards, almost all of that focus is on economics and politics. Mm. I don't yeah. think those things are necessarily could be pulled apart though. That's like, true. Yeah. Be very intersectional um, to create like people's own personal experiences. Like, you know, gender isn't like a universal thing. Like you can just say yeah. like it's balanced with like economics. Um, yeah, those things like in someone's own unique personal experiences can't necessarily be like pulled apart to like, you know, oh, like my identity as a, a you know, like a white person or like my identity as a like woman, it's all like put together. And, and I think also like, those, I think, may, Rachel, you make a point, like, this is true, like, it's not, I'm not saying capitalism inform, directly informs every single aspect of our lives, like, I think gender and race are very um, important things that on the surface don't have anything to do with, like, market share and consumption and consuming, but also, like, if we take a look at our history with racism, it is economic, like, if we take a look at slavery, like, slavery we was an economic system and a way to get free labor, I think, like, the way, especially American society is set up, like, it, people are oppressed because it makes someone else money at the end of the day. And so, like, I think our gender identity and our racial identities are very important, but also, like, who is on the top of the totem pole, as it were, is almost always going to be tied to who is making the most money. Yeah. Who, who is on top of the totem pole? I'm going to bracket that and we're going to go back to that great phrase when we talk about Uranus. Um, to add to Jonathan's point, another thing that I find interesting in American consumer culture is the way that identities such as race and gender can also be commodified. Um, and even in slavery, that's sort of what happened and bodies can be exploited. But um, now a lot of social movements are commodified and turned into like t-shirts and like the gay pride movement has been commercialized and there's like this emergence of rainbow capitalism so i think that's another interesting point to add to the completion of identities with capitalism yeah i actually so i totally agree with you on that i'm not sure how many people in this class are in linguistics but something we covered was actually a rejection of capitalism um in the 19 something admittedly i don't remember exactly when was actually turned into fuel for more capitalism and made it more successful than ever. They basically, a lot wait, of- Wait, can you repeat that please? Sorry, it like spaced out for my computer. Oh, totally. Yeah, so I think it was like the 1960s or something. Um, there was a huge rejection of capitalism and the perceived manipulation of people into behaving in a way that people thought was morally unjust. Um, and that movement was actually turned into 
marketing strategies by companies that allowed them to actually further their profits and makes made the system that we had today we have today where they market towards people with different lifestyles and market towards your individuality um so i completely agree with you on that i think that capital capitalism has become closely tied into a lot of different aspects of our lives um I guess the reason I don't consider it completely dominant, however, is because I feel like even though it's closely tied into all those parts, those parts are still what we focus on individually. We attempt to end racism because we believe it's wrong, even though, and, and it got started because of capitalism, but it's not necessarily the reason that we stopped it. I mean, don't get me wrong, capitalism played a role in that. But I just think that despite it being integrated in all parts of our lives, it doesn't completely dominate our minds the way that I think it could. Again, that's my opinion. I, I, I think going Wait, off. Frozen? Oh, okay. I think going off a lot of what other people have been saying, I think how we experience capitalism and economics in the US is that it's tied in with so many different facets of our society that like at a point it it's hard to build strict identities or or categories for that um i do think that class is such a big component of how we build our identities in america but i also do think that class is fungible and there aren't hard borders between it like there's big lifestyle differences between you know, working class people and upper middle class people. Um, but there's not huge lifestyle differences between like upper middle class people and like upper upper class people necessarily. Um, like those people might be going to the same schools. Those people might be driving the same cars. Um, it, that's still a very important component of our society, but it's not something that is so crystal clear. Um, and I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like connect this to, to the economic situation of the Soviet Union, because um, I feel like in Palavin's book, there's a lot of wealth advertisement um, and that the people who have a lot of money are showing that money in the new Russia, but I also think that happens in the US. So I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the differences between those two systems other than different stages of capitalism. Um, I just, I'll add on. So, go ahead. <laughs> oh, um, so I think what I've seen from like what I've seen from the comments is that even even in the U.S., there is this there is this overwhelming sense of capitalism. We still have um, we still have things that identify our identity. Um, besides capitalism and in Palavin's book I I really see that it sort of takes over their life as the Soviet government did um it's sort of totalitarian in its own way mm -hmm. um and I think that's because if I if we can go back to maybe um in the state of post-Soviet aphasia that yes that work um where they talked about like a lack of identity um i think it's for the specific reason capitalism takes over everything in russia is because of russia's lack of identity yeah i agree with you one thing that i think though is um technically in the united states you could have your identity be run by capitalism and like by the views of capitalism and all of the characteristics of it because like um gaps in pay for any gender and for race is extremely mm -hmm. like prevalent mm -hmm. in the united states and also like when we had talked about religion most religions whether you're non-denominational or not will have some kind of i forget what the word is but it's where you give 10 percent of your earnings to the church tithe. And so like whether oh. you think about it or not tithe. 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 what a tithe. Oh, 
Thank you. I forgot what it was called. Um, whether you think about it or not, capitalism is prevalent in your life. And so like in religion and in your gender and in like everything that will make you up as a person, like if you have your family values, your family values are run most of the time probably by the, by capitalism somehow. You just have to like think about it. And so, um, well, okay. Can I, can I make an argument there? Um, sorry, my hair is out of control. Um, I think that although you're correct, I think to some degree you're conflating capitalism with economics when they're not necessarily always tied together. Like take the tithe, for example, that's the idea that you give 10% of your income. And yes, that relies on you having an income, but that could still be true under a communist model. And it could be true under many different economic models, not that many are coming to mind at the moment. And I think that it's true that a lot of our values and a lot of what we do has a lot to do with economics, but I'm not sure that all of them are capitalism specific. Um, I would actually, so I'm going to make a weird analogy really quick. I'm not sure if it's going to be a good analogy or not. Um, but if, if we picture capitalism is like drinking alcohol, then I feel like Americans kind of do a glass or a cup or whatever throughout the whole day, nonstop, even when we're sleeping. And then Russians at this point in post-Soviet Union are chugging it and getting drunk. Branching. Okay. Also okay. Weird Branching. analogy, but it's kind of how... Binge doing. capitalism. Binge I actually capital. like that a lot. Hilton, do you want to yeah. comment on that idea? Um, so I feel like like branching off of Rachel's point, a lot of things are being attributed to capitalism that can also exist within a communist society. Like in Russia, they use slave labor because it was economical. That's with the gulags. Um, like there also is, or I think there was racism um, in Russia during the Soviet Union um, because there were ethnic groups in Russia that were discriminated against and there still are. Um, so there's that too. Um, there's something else that I forget, but there's a lot of stuff that exists just in humanity that's not necessarily capitalist. And I feel like the important distinction between those things is there. Let's, um, let's, let's go, let's, let's sort of, um, put a touch, touchstone to this. Um, how does, Pelevin offer a response to totalitarianism after the Soviet Union. Would you say he sees another form of totalitarianism in Russia after the Soviet Union? Um, if so, where? What is it? And, you know, Rachel had mentioned um, binge drinking of, of capitalism. Um, and Hilton makes the makes the connection um, between how life was in the Soviet Union and the then you know reaction to it. Um, does anyone have? And Mary Catherine, she offered a wonderful comment on this topic on Blackboard. But there are also some really great quotes from the novel. Why don't we just, I absolutely love this discussion, and it's just a, a goldmine of ideas. Um, would anyone like to sort of crystallize some of their ideas about this new form of totalitarianism in post-Soviet Russia that is steeped in binge capitalism? Would anyone like to sort of connect that and concretize it in um, in some quotes from the novel, why don't we all take, and particularly from some of you who have been um, listening to the discussion, but might it's really hard for Zoom to pick up um, to, to pick up preemptive sighs and ums and gestures and whatnot. So I'm sure that there are some other people here in our big room that have some ideas, um, but Zoom might not be picking it up. So why don't we just take 30 seconds or so to go to our books and see maybe somebody has written something in the margins, um, or there's something about totalitarianism of another kind, of a post-Soviet kind, um, that they'd like to bring to the table. So let's just pause for 30 seconds 
um, if you have an opportunity to look, look to the book for um, a quote or two. Yeah, and if you if you have a quote in mind um, in a couple of seconds, I invite you to share it with us. And also, if you just want to give me a sign by like doing a, a hands up or putting in the chat, you know, I have a quote, just so that I can um, get to everybody who might want to share something on this important topic. Um, I have a comment. Yeah. Uh, in the reactions bar, there's like a little clap and a thumbs up emoji. Um, yeah. There, so that can be used, I guess. Good. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay. Rachel's got a thumbs up. Uh, Jake has a thumbs up. Luke has a clap. So we'll do Jake. Rachel, Luke, Mary Catherine, Nathaniel. I was actually just doing the thumbs up to Hilden's comment, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So Jake, and then we'll go to Luke, and then we'll go to Mary Catherine, and then to Nathaniel. Um, if anyone has, yeah, feel free to share a quote, and you can just read it aloud. Just let us know the page number. But I'm still looking for a quote. I didn't thumbs up to put a quote, and I just thumbs up to try it. But I'm on the reading now. Okay. All right. What about, um, well, Jake, whenever you want to contribute a quote, just let us know. Luke, would you like to give us a quote? Luke, you're so I've muted. been muted. Shut up, Alex. I realize <laughs> that now. All right. It was somewhere earlier in the book. I'm looking for the quote now. But is it it's talking about how yeah. uh, like instead of like goods and services being traded, it's like space and time and like how it's taken over like all aspects of living. And like even the astronauts, uh, they had a strike back in the day, or the cosmonauts, because they wouldn't fly for $30,000. They wanted 300000 like the Americans. So, like, they weren't, uh, like, searching the cosmos for, like, science. They were searching for money and stuff like that. It, I think that's like a pretty cool way to think about like how far like money had gone into the roots of society, even throughout like communist times. Good, good. I like it. Awesome. Um, Mary Catherine, would you like to share? Um, yeah. Okay. So I, I brought this quote up in my, um, in my Blackboard post, but, um, I think one of, one of the good examples of this question, um, comes in chapter two, I believe. I have the online version. Um, but it's where, um, Tatarsky sees these old worn out shoes um and sort of compares them to the soviet the soviet union compared to the government now um or capitalism the new totalitarian authority um and i think it's a really good example of how one just 
completely replaced the other. Good, excellent. On that note, um, maybe before we go to Nathaniel's comments, perhaps I could get a volunteer to read. Um, I'm gonna move on to, Mary Catherine mentioned this great comment in the context of chapter two. Um, I wanted to move on to chapter three, and I was wondering if there might be a, a volunteer, let me put this into gallery mode, um, raise your hand or give a thumbs up. If you, maybe if you haven't spoken much, if you'd like to volunteer to read a section, um, maybe KT, would you like to read? If you have the, if anyone has the book, because it's, it's page 21 and 22 in the book. Um, I don't have like page numbers. I just have like okay. a up version. But I do have a quote that's kind of similar to Mary Catherine. All right, let's, KT, let's go to your quote. Okay. And then um, I'll ask, I'll ask um, Maggie or Caroline um, or Mallory, someone who, who, who's with us um, but might not have been able, Zoom might not have picked up yet on their voice yet to read an excerpt. Um, but KT, let's hear, let's hear from your example. Um, so it's like right after the beginning of, or it's like in the beginning of chapter six, mm -hmm. he's like walking into, I think it's like another advertising firm. An hour and a half later, Tatarsky walked into the immense building of the Pravda complex, which is Russian for true, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so that's that kind of significant. The building that had once housed the editorial offices of almost all Soviet newspapers. A pass was ready and waiting for him at the duty desk. He went up to the eighth floor and found the room with the number he needed. There was a metal plate on the door bearing the words ideological department, apparently a leftover from Soviet times, or maybe not, thought Tatarsky. And so I kind of thought that was interesting because it like, shows kind of the shift from the old times to the new times and mm -hmm. how it says like it's the ideological department and so that like to me just kind of meant like like the beliefs of the Soviet Union but obviously like you can be super open about your beliefs especially like if they were religious anything like that and then how he comments or maybe not which kind of shows that Tatarsky is like just you know going with the grain of capitalism now and he is losing the ability to like think not freely because now he's kind of like in his own confined system of religion mixed with capitalism as we've seen like through his hallucinations Yes, yes. Well, those are great ideas. And I actually wanted to pause and go back to this character, Tatarsky, especially since in lecture I set it up as he, how he, or at least how scholars have seen him as um, a precursor for Putin on the connection of, of controlling the capitalist market in Russia. But before that, let's, um, let's also go back to the beginning of what KT said uh, with sort of replacing the Soviet structure and the totalitarian authoritarian structure of the Soviet Union with authoritarianism of a different kind of capitalism. And Nicole has so kindly um, volunteered to read. Nicole, if you see the bottom of page 21, where um, it actually starts in italics. And yeah. Italics are kind of annoying, but there are a lot of great ideas in these italics. So I was wondering, Nicole, if you wouldn't mind reading from the bottom of 21, um, the first point that must be taken into consideration, he wrote in his concepts, um, yeah. all the way to Sprite and the Nicola for Nicola, on page 22. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, in this, that the situation that exists at the present moment in Russia cannot continue for very long. 
In the very near future, we must accept most of the essential branches of industry to come to a total standstill. The collapse of the financial system and serious social upheavals, which will all inevitably end in the establishment of a military dictatorship, regardless of its political and economic program, the future dictatorship will attempt to exploit national nationalistic slogans. The dominant state aesthetic will be the pseudo Slavic style. This term is not used here in a negative judgmental sense as distinct from the Slavic style, which does not exist anywhere in the real world. The pseudo Slavic style represents a carefully structured progman. I'm not sure what that word is. Par, 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 it's, thank you. Um, within the space structured by the symbolic signifiers of this style, traditional Western advertising is inconceivable. Therefore, it will either be banned completely or subjected to rigorous censorship. This all has to be taken into consideration in determining any kind of long-term strategy. Keep going. Let us take a classic positioning slogan. Spirit. Sprite. Oh, sorry. Sprite. <laughs> the Uncola. Continue reading. Yeah, go, go all the way down to that big um, capitalized caption that centers it. So just read another uh, two, two paragraphs. Okay. Its use in Russia would seem to us to be most appropriate, but for somewhat different reasons than in America. The term uncola, i.e. non-cola, positions Sprite very successfully against Pepsi Cola and Coca-Cola, creating a special niche for this product in the consensus of the Western consumer. But it is a well known it yeah, but it is a well known fact that in the countries of Eastern Europe, Coca Cola is more of an ideological fetish than a refreshing soft drink. If, for instance, Hershey drinks are positioned as possessing the taste of victory, then Coca-Cola possesses the taste of freedom, as declared in the 70s and 80s by a vast number of Eastern European defectors. For the Russian consumer, therefore, the term uncola has extensive anti-democratic and anti-liberal connotations, which makes it highly attractive and promising in conditions of military dictatorship. Transform, translated into Russian uncola would become ni, Nikola. The sound of the word similar to the old Russian name Nikola and the associations aroused by it offer a perfect fit with the aesthetic required by the likely future scenario. A possible version of the slogan, Sprite. The Nikola for Nikola. So you've got to take Pelevin's ideas um, with an open mind. He's, nothing is really bold and straightforward and matter of fact at all in this writing. Um, you know, he's grappling and grasping desperately for some way to take a Western capitalist idea and make it relevant to the Soviet Union. Um, and he, he does this with, you know, playing with, with un, um, uncola, um, and, and, and sort of a, as a gesture of, of how, of how contemporary Russia, um, you know, became Russia, but, but un, un-Soviet. Um, as well, and then he he sort of he plays with sounds and syllables to try to make it slight, you know, try to make it more Slavonic. Nikola, 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 Nicholas. Um, so nothing is ever really straightforward or concrete, but 
you see a lot of linguistic play, um, a lot of mixing and combining of the Western slogans and trying desperately to place it somewhere in, not only so much in concrete Soviet history, but more so in, in Soviet memory and mentality. Um, you know, like a number of Eastern European defectors um, gesture towards what it was like in the 70s and 80s, you know, back when, when people remember being, when they were Soviet and in a socialist society and enjoyed sitting on the beach um, and drinking Coca-Cola and, and trying to get a sense of what it must be like on the distant shores of a Western capitalist society. Now, all of a sudden, that is, um, that is in, in Russia at the moment. So part of the frustration of reading this book is that, um, you know, things are not straightforward and clear. He, he never really succeeds, at least in our minds, of coming up with a really good logical slogan that actually makes sense. There's always something just a little bit off in, in all the slogans that he comes up with and all the ideas that he comes up with. And maybe again, that comes back to the topic of aphasia. Everyone's language is just slightly off right now. They can't really come up with language that specifically identifies and targets what needs to be targeted. And this is, this is a problem of, of post-Soviet Russia. We, we, everything is capitalist binge drinking. It's all new. Nothing has been formulated. No one is used to the environment to moderate anything. It's just all at once, all of a sudden. Um, and, and so if you feel frustrated with the text, it's, it's because... I think this this theme of aphasia um, permeates the novel. I wanted to say a couple words about Tatarsky, 